Well, good morning to everybody. And I just wanted to say thank you. Um, welcome to the fifth in a series of free webinars hosted by the Chamber of Commerce under the theme Supporting Businesses in a Time of Crisis. I'm Will Pinot, I'm the CEO of the Chamber. Uh, this webinar is a legal assist session. The Chamber is today partnering with HSM to provide expert legal advice on the topic wills, estate, succession planning in a COVID-19 and post-COVID-19 world. The goal of this session is to provide you with expert guidance that will help you to take some necessary practical steps to protect your assets. The lead, um, the lead facilitator and panelist will be for the webinar will be Robert Mack. He's the head of private clients and trusts at HSM. Robert specializes in private and commercial trusts and advises high net worth families and, a trust, and trust companies. He joined at HSM in <clears throat> excuse me, 2016, having previously worked at a top tier international law firms in the Cayman Islands in London. He has been practicing in Cayman Cam Islands law exclusively since 2007. And since 2010, he has been a member of the local branch of the Society of Trusts and Estate Practitioners where he currently holds the position of branch secretary. He sits on the step legislative review subcommittee and works in partnership with the Cayman Islands government to implement and improve legislation connected to trusts and private client industry. He's the author of several professional journal articles and has spoken at local and international trust conferences on a wide variety of topics. Uh, so before I turn over to Robert, let me remind you that you may submit questions during the presentation via the chat feature. However, unlike in other webinars where you received immediate responses to your chat questions, we'll compile the answers and send them to you in a question and answer format after the webinar. We will, however, be having the usual question and answer segment at the end of the presentation when you'll be able to get immediate responses. So once again, I'd like to Thank all of you for joining us today, and I'll turn it over to Robert. Thanks very much, Will, and uh, good morning to everyone in attendance. Thank you very much for making the time this morning to, uh, to hear about a sobering topic at a, in a sobering time. Um, so what I'm going to do is do an overview first of general estate planning and then what I will do is I will comment and do a little uh, sort of mini presentation on how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected estate planning and how our industry here in the Cayman Islands, meaning um, uh, people like me who do trust and estates type work have been impacted by that and, and, and how that has impacted on our practice. So um, what I'm gonna do is, that's the little overview. So um, those are the, the basic things that I'll run through. And as Will said, um, you know, questions are welcome. Um, you know, it's, you know, please feel free to put up your hand or, 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 or you know, put a little message. Uh, there's a couple of different options to do that and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I think practically I've been told it's a little bit difficult to do it while the presentation is in train. Um, so, um, you know, feel free to, to drop down your questions as, as you go and, and then when we reach the, the end of the presentation, I can, I can run through those. Um, so let, let's start. Um, so what I'm going to do is start off with uh, the importance of having a will. So let's get on with the first thing. So um, one of the great things about the Cayman Islands, um, you could, well, some great things, sometimes not great things. As with all things, there's a double-edged sword with, with, uh, with certain things, is that we have what we call complete freedom of disposition in the Cayman Islands, which means no matter who your dependents are, uh, how many children you have, whether you're married, not married, if you want to give your assets away under your will to the cat's home or to somebody walking down the street, um, you can do that. Um, you have no obligation to, um, to, to look into uh, the needs of any family members or uh, you know, uh, married spouses, anything like that. You have complete freedom of disposition, which is quite unique in many places of the world. 
Um, and uh, so that allows any person doing a Cayman Islands will to select whoever they wish and benefit however they wish. Um, now, the downside of that, obviously, is persons who might be expected to have um, benefited from your will, uh, such as, say, children and spouses, uh, may feel a bit aggrieved if you've given away all of your assets to the cat's home. Uh, but that is the law as it is in the Cayman Islands. And uh, like I say, it, 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 it has good sides and bad sides. Um, now, the other upside of having a, of doing a will is you get to select the guardians for your minor children. So obviously, where you've got um, the typical scenario where you've got um, a married couple um, and one of them dies, um, you know, the, the usual default is the survivor takes uh, possession of the children. Uh, but of course, if, if uh, both parents die, uh, then there's a question, well, what happens to those children? In your will, you can select your guardians and the law will respect that. Um, if you don't have a will, then it becomes a little more complicated and a court process is required. Um, and there's no guarantee as to who will become the guardians of your children. So that's, a, that's an often overlooked thing in wills, in a sense that it's not just about disposing of property. Um, it's also about looking after the interests of your children and making sure that they're looked after if, if the worst happens. Um, the other thing which is um, kind of a new trend and thing, things that I've been working on is in addition to just regular assets, you know, homes, bank accounts, that sort of thing, um, I'm seeing a growing um, desire to deal with digital assets and online presence. So digital assets being things like online store credits, uh, cryptocurrencies, uh, things of that nature, um, which often get overlooked um, and if you don't tell people or you don't tell your executors uh, that you have these assets, um, it's quite easy for them to get missed. And on top of that, things like cryptocurrencies have very complex keys which allow you to access them. So you have to be able to tell your executors how to access those, those assets. So there's, there's, there's a number of very sort of infamous cases. Uh, I think that one that happened a couple of years ago in Canada was a guy who ran a cryptocurrency uh, exchange um, and had something in the region of about 130 million in cryptocurrency. And he died, didn't tell anyone where the key is and all of his investors lost out. Um, so those sorts of things are now being dealt with in wills. Um, and I do that on a regular basis. Um, you know, Taking that into account, I always ask clients whether they have digital assets, what those are and how to access them. Um, the other thing I'm doing, again, just a newer trend, management of your online presence uh, after you die. Uh, you know, a lot of us will know people or know of people who, who have died unexpectedly, um, and they continue to have active social media accounts. Um, and actually trying to get those things closed down um, is very bureaucratic and very difficult. So it can be quite distressing uh, for persons to continue their loved ones with a Facebook account that, um, you know, months or years after they've died. So another thing you can deal with in your will uh, is to uh, give your executors the ability to access and manage your online presence so that those accounts can be shut down. Uh, you, can, um, you can effectively pass on messages your executors can pass on messages after you go. So for things like funeral arrangements and that sort of thing and, and pass on messages saying, look, this account is going to be deactivated. Um, it just saves a lot of hassle of having to go through those bureaucratic steps of getting things um, well. So that's just another sort of new trend in most people have been saying. Um, what will allows you to do is deal with assets in multiple jurisdictions. So um, you often hear things about uh, worldwide wills. So it's, it's entirely possible you can do a will that not only with your assets in the Cayman Islands, but also just in different parts of the world, wherever you may have assets. Now, sometimes that can work and sometimes it can't. My, my general um, advice to clients who have assets in various jurisdictions is to have each of those jurisdictions because the succession laws in different jurisdictions operate differently and they'll be so different as not so it's always take advice and have the wills in each one of those jurisdictions 
Um, the other thing that's nice about having a will is you can defer gifts to your, your beneficiaries, your heirs. So for example, if you have, and when I say children, adult children, children who are say over the age of 18, um, you know, it may not necessarily be the best thing for them to get a large lump sum out of your estate, say age 20. Uh, in, in fact, you feel more comfortable staggering that out over the course of you know, 10 years, for example. So, you know, a lot of clients will say, um, you know, I want them to get a lump sum at 20 and age 25 and age 30, or I want them to get a lump sum when they get married, or I want them to get a lump sum after they've completed their university education. All that is completely possible with a will. Um, and again, another, another good reason to use one is where you have beneficiaries who are uh, vulnerable. So uh, if, you're, if they're suffering from any uh, mental or physical uh, challenges, uh, dependency challenges, things like uh, you know, gambling or drugs, these sorts of things, uh, what you do is you can effectively break off a part of your estate, have it managed by your executors, and they can benefit certain beneficiaries um, according to their needs. Um, and so, for example, we, we take the example of, say, a beneficiary who, who has a drug addiction problem. Well, giving them a lump sum of money is not going to be in their best interest. Uh, but if you have a trustee managing the fund, they do pay for um, uh, treatment programs and that sort of thing. So that's, again, a, a very, very good, uh, a, a good feature of having a will. Um, yeah. It allows to effectively manage the process well after you, you, you died. Um, the other thing we, you need to keep in mind, uh, as a advisor, um, I'm always on the lookout to ensure that person's mental capacity is there. I will, uh, because obviously if you don't have sufficient mental capacity or there is some effects uh, upon you, so that may create, uh, may cause you to have undue influence. Um, you know, uh, that can affect the validity of a will. Um, the other thing that I as an advisor have to, have to do is drill down into person's history to figure out whether they are in fact domiciled in the King Islands. Because uh, if they're domiciled elsewhere, um, you find that um, the, the laws of those territories outside of King Islands may affect their estate. And that's actually quite, um, it, it's quite a common feature in Cayman Islands. Because what we have is we have a large population of expatriates who come from work permits um, territories that have um, you know, very different succession regimes. Um, and if, if those persons have maintained links to those countries, strong links, then sometimes those countries can put their rules on that particular person uh, based on, on that they have retained their domicile. Um, there's another. Uh, that, for instance, places like the United States, which which tax their their citizens on their worldwide estates. So you know, even if a United States person has successfully shed their domicile of the U.S., the fact that they're U.S. citizen means they fall into the net. So there's a lot of a lot of little intricacies about um, being a well. That's the funny thing is um, one of the myths you have to dispel about wills is there's a very simple things. Oh, why you know uh, I just need a simple will. Um, the amount of per that in practice, and then you, you get into the nitty gritty of it, and you find actually most people's wills have at least one or two applications. And so you really have to drill into those things and, and make sure that no one's left on the turn. Um, the other thing is, we, we, have a, we have powers of attorney here, which is another, uh, another thing, which basically is a sheet of paper which allows other persons to do things for you. But there are limitations on those, and those limitations are uh, once you lose capacity, they are no longer valid. Um, and the other limitation is once you die, they become invalid. So those, uh, you know, people looking to depend on powers of attorney are, um, you know, a little bit left short in Cayman. Um, now there are some, um, there are some discussions about uh, enhancing our powers of attorney regime here, but that's sort of outside the scope here. But at the moment, that's where the law stands. Um, the other thing to, to understand about wills is if you have joint assets with somebody else, for instance, a joint bank account, typically those assets fall outside of your estate, meaning they won't pass under your will. Um, and that would become important a bit later on when we, we get on to the next couple of slides. Yeah, get on to the next slide. Let's do 
Peter Cooperance, which isn't at the moment. Okay, here we go. Next slide. So, what is the situation if you do not have a will? Um, if you don't have a will, effectively, the law applies a formula called the, intest the intestacy formula, which basically is a set formula which prescribes who gets what in what shares. And for a lot of people, that works well. Um, and, it, and some people actually will isn't necessary because what the law strives to do is, is try to be fair and equitable um, to all the persons in that person's life. So, you know, the persons most closely connected by marriage or blood will, will benefit in particular shares. And um, in some instances, that works perfectly fine. And actually, a will isn't that important. Um, now, the, uh, the problem, though, is it doesn't, if you die intestate, uh, then there's a provision of minor children, so the court has to figure that out. Uh, there's no scope to defer vesting, which basically means um, those persons that are intestate to get their share right away, whether or not they're, um, you know, in a position to receive it or in a good position to receive it. Um, for persons who run businesses and own company shares, this can be a real problem because what ends up happening is when you apply the intestacy formula to business assets, uh, such as shares in a private company, the ownership of that business fractures. So you can have, go from a business that has one shareholder to one that has 10. Um, and all of a sudden the business can break down because what you have is, um, you know, you have 10 different people wanting to go in 10 different directions. Uh, so for any persons who have, uh, who are running a business and they're effectively the, the primary or only owner, um, you know, having the will in mind is absolutely essential. Um, the other thing that um, not having the will does is any sentimental items, jewelry, art, homes, vehicles, any personal items, um, they'll just get divided up on the intestacy formula. So if you wanted your, you know, your son to have a, a, your, your special watch or your daughter to have, the, the, you know, uh, the wedding ring, they won't get it. It, it, just, it just passes through the statutory formula. Now there's ways and means that you can adjust that, but that's the, that's the default position. Uh, the other thing about not having a will is things like digital assets and so on um, may not be picked up. And some of those, sometimes those things can be very, very valuable. And the other thing, as I said, your online presence may continue to haunt the internet, meaning, you know, social media accounts, anything like that uh, can, can roll on for, for months or years before they're deactivated. So that, again, can sometimes uh, cause distress for family members. Now, I've told you all the reasons why um, having a will is a good idea. Now I'm gonna tell you the drawbacks of having a will. Um, I would say that the, the main thing that people need to understand about when they're making a will is you have to have a valid will. And if there's any um, doubt about validity of the will, it can be challenged. Uh, you can end up in court in very expensive estate uh, litigation and estate litigation highly emotive uh, because it's family members fighting over their share and um, so it's very important again me as an advisor um, to uh, when I'm dealing with a client um, to look at any signs of mental incapacity for example because that's a very easy way to attack a will well not easy but it is it is a common way to attack a will uh, looking for signs of, of rest or being forced to doing a will for some reason um, Obviously, forgery is, is, is a problem uh, in some instances. And the other thing is just a failure to observe execution. Now, this is um, basically in the Cayman Islands, what we have is a system whereby if you want a will to be valid, it has to be uh, witnessed by two and it witnesses who must be present at the time of signing. Now, in, in, in times of, of social isolation and social distancing, this has become a real challenge for practitioners here because. The, the normal procedure is, once the will is in final form is you get in a room with the or a testatrix, uh, the person making the will, and you have you know, witnesses in the room watching them sign. And typically, I, I get, um, get them each and every page of initial sign and witness at the end. Now, that's a challenge for practitioners here because obviously um, trying to do these things um, when really not your house unless you're going for a medical appointment or food. Uh, it's problematic 
Um, there's no scope to do these things virtually. Uh, I know there's relaxation really with respect to execution of the documents, uh, but that does not apply to wills currently. Now that may change, uh, and we're looking at doing potentially, when I say we, uh, step with the Society of Trust and State Petitioners is in communication with the government potentially about relaxing those rules. Uh, and they have relaxed them in other jurisdictions, which allow for virtual witnessing, but at the moment, it's not the case here. So um, what I'm advising clients to do is, is um, really, if possible, wait until restrictions are lifted um, and just observe uh, social distancing. It's just so ex not executing a will inside a building, maybe being outside in the open air, um, you know, with protective gear and that sort of thing. So there's Again, complications is right reside, reside that. Um, the other thing that you need to understand is a will once you die and it becomes probated is it becomes a document anyone can rock up and pay a fee and get a copy of that. So not only will um, your beneficiaries be noted, but the value of your estate will be made public. So for some people that you know that's uh, a surprise, but that is the case. Um, the other thing about um, you know, uh, drawbacks of having a will is, you know, uh, assets may pass to people who are unsuited or, so again, we talk about people who are vulnerable or, or, or too young to receive assets. But of course, you can, you can deal with that through a will trust provision. So just putting a trust in your will to, to um, defer those gifts, those gifts. Uh, so there is a, there is a, a mechanism there. Um, the other thing is the probate procedures and can some be lengthy and expensive. Uh, especially if it becomes contentious um, and, you know, that can complicate fact your personal assets will be managed by individuals who may not have knowledge of your financial and personal affairs. So what that means is um, when you, when an individual dies, there's a procedure of court application that has to be made to obtain what's called a grant of probate. And the grant of probate is effectively the court um, confirming the will is correct and the person who are administered are persons as a matter of law. Now, if there's any debate about that um, by any beneficiaries, they, there are procedures that they can challenge those applications. And even after challenge is, is, is even after the grant probate is, is issued, it's it, you know a state litigation can arise. Um, so you know you, you do see that from time to time, not in every you know it's it's more the exception than the rule, but when it does happen it, it can be very emotive and very um, the other thing people need to understand is that a will is not something that you do. You uh, you know you put it in the shelf or put it in the drawer and forget about it. Actually, you have to review it regularly to take into account any changes in personal or financial circumstances, especially uh, with respect to COVID. We'll come on to this in financial circumstances because we've seen obviously historic drops in uh, stock market and various and people's assets have taken a real hit. Um, so, uh, if you have a, an existing will, uh, whereby you have gifts of uh, things like shares or whatever, those may may need to be rebalanced to reflect the you know um, state of the value of those. And again, we'll come on to that in a bit. Uh, in, in a bit, uh, the other thing you know people don't realize is things like marriage can revoke uh, an otherwise valid will. So that's something that people just no, it's not a common thing, but. Case. So, the other thing you can do, well, there's a, there's a couple of other things that you can do uh, without using a will. A will is, again, a key document in any estate plan, and no estate plan is complete without it. But um, what a lot of people do is they do lifetime planning. And what that means is you set up something during your life that will subsist after. And the, one of the primary things people use are trusts. So basically, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with trusts, trusts are basically legal arrangements where an individual gifts property to a person called the trustee, and that trustee holds that property for beneficiaries on the terms of the trust instrument. So the trust instrument is, is kind of like the agreement between the settler being the person who sets the trust and the trustee, and it sets out all things that trustees needs to do. Um, it's also possible trusts can arise automatically as a matter of law, but that's, again, just, I just add that on as a, 
addendum. It's not really part of the discussion today. Now, the trust is is a well used concept. It's been around uh, millennia, and it's it's tied up in the courts and common law jurisdictions. So the concepts are very well respected and very well understood. Um, and the Cayman Islands has a very um, flexible team. Trusts are very holding virtually any sort of asset. There's, there's almost virtually no asset trust hold. Um, and the key point is once an asset is held on trust, it no longer forms part of your estate. So it's entirely possible correct planning. Uh, you can get your estate down to zero value. So there'll be no need to do an application for grant of probate. In some instances, you may not even need a will. Um, so what that does is it preserves the amount of your um, uh, confidentiality with respect to your affairs because then you know, you'd have a that becomes a public document. There's no uh, disclosure of the value of what you own when you die. So there's, there's good reason to do it if privacy is concerned. Um, the other thing to know about Cayman Islands trusts is actually they can, they're very unique and very cutting edge and have been so for a long time. So for example, the, the whole concept of a trust is that effectively you give your property to the trustee and that property is no longer yours. You, uh, you no longer um, own those assets. Now for some people, that's a bit of a step too far because obviously it, you know, giving value assets away to an individual and hoping that they do the right thing um, can, can be quite a leap of faith. So what we have in Cayman is we have what we call reserve powers trusts. And what that does is it allows the SAT board to retain a certain amount of control over the administration of the trust. So you can revoke the trust, you can amend the provisions, you can have powers to make capital or income appointments. Uh, you can reserve powers to manage the investments, uh, move trustees, replace trustees, remove beneficiaries, etc. Uh, appoint beneficiaries. So actually, you can have quite a bit of control for a trust, even though you don't, you're not, you're no longer the legal owner of. So they're very good and very flexible. Um, the other thing about establishing a trust is there's no tax implication. Obviously, we're we're you know pretty pro tax um, uh, jurisdiction with respect to this. Uh, there's no government fees, no annual fees, unless of course you engage a professional trustee. Age of professional trustees to run, um, then there will be trustee fees. Um, if you have connections to any foreign country, and sometimes, oftentimes, the tax implications of that. So you need to, uh, as there's a uh, drill down, look and see, well, what are your connections to countries and um, what are the tax effects of them? Um, we also have a new, relatively new, uh, which is something called the foundation. Company. You may have heard of this. Um, you know, foundation companies are great for a lot of different things, and I'm seeing a real increase in interest in these things. And effectively, what you can do is um, it can act as a trust substitute. So effectively, it's a company which can contain provisions which look like a trust and act like a trust, but in fact, it is a company. Um, so it's a hybrid between a trust and a company, and in the world, in the you know estates and, and, and planning world, it, they, they're very good and very good for entrepreneurial people who are used to running companies and more familiar with them. Trust can be quite foreign and a lot of people are scared of trust because they don't understand them. And they're just a bit too difficult. Um, so this is another option for people like that. Um, and the great thing about companies is you can actually sit on the board of it and run it. Um, so that, that gives you a even greater control than you might with, with uh, a traditional trust. So just to touch on a couple of points on how the COVID has uh, affected um, my industry. Uh, really, the primary effect has been, uh, you know, a, a, an immediate and shocking decrease in wealth felt at all levels of society. Um, so if you have a plan in place and you've already um, set out your gifts to various family members, friends, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm encouraging clients now to, to revisit their wills, have a look and, you know, really have a sober look at um, what their, um, their assets are now worth and protect 
potentially rebalancing. Um, because uh, again, it, it's, it's, it's a good exercise to do simply because it reduces the, any scope for arguments uh, that, that some people have been hard done by um, and potential estate litigation around. Um, we're also having some uh, perspective collection verification due diligence and getting documents notarized, et cetera. Now, again, there's been recent relaxation on that and some emergency legislation which has been pushed through throughout the government. But uh, the extent to which, and we, we discussed that, and we discussed social distancing and so on. Um, the other thing that's been problematic is is face-to-face -face meetings are now have all ceased. Um, which makes it more difficult to deal with elderly clients. They're not particularly good at technology. They're used to face-to-face -face meetings, et cetera. And for me, as a practitioner, it becomes more difficult to assess things like mental health or duress and these sorts of things. Uh, very difficult to at this at this point in time. The only um, solution to that is uh, hopefully a wait for uh, restrictions to uh, ease up a little bit. Hopefully we can sort of get back to that, but in, in situations where it's an emergency, um, then it's, it's tricky. Um, obviously, for, for anyone who is, who's suffering from COVID or basically or ill uh, in care facilities or hospital, uh, this is a real, again, a real practical problem for practitioners on how, uh, how do we deal with that, what precautions we take, can we come to hospitals at this point unless it's, you know, we're there for a medical emergency. I mean, I've not thankfully had any instructions to go and, and do deathbed wills or do a series of those in my career. Um, and um, not pleasant to deal with. But at this point, I'm, I'm struggling to do that. I, it would be a real difficulty for me. And I think for any practitioner. Um, so just a quick run through uh, of, of what the Cayman Islands government has been doing to uh, to relax and, and to deal with certain things as a result of COVID. Well, the two key things for um, uh, for well, fiduciaries is they've relaxed uh, factor reporting deadlines. They've relaxed CRS reporting. Uh, SEMA has been very good with respect to keeping dialogue with the Society of Trust and State Practitioners, which is a local uh, association which uh, deals with uh, you know, this area. And I'm in regular dialogue, we're in regular dialogue with them on Zoom calls. We do uh, twice, uh, every week we do a, a Skype team and they're, they're listening to our concerns and feeding that through uh, to government. Um, so that's very, very good. Um, SEMA continues to function well. I've reports from other practitioners that they're, they're continuing to be very responsive. Uh, the court is carrying on, the general registry is carrying on. So the government is actually, um, really managed to keep us open for business and there's, there's a lot of credit to them for doing that. That sort of messaging is going out to our clients uh, globally and, and, and getting very positive feedback from that. Um, just a, a real quick rundown of just general succession plan. Um, so we talked about trust and foundation companies, um, how you can design your to impart benefit on friends and family shares and proportions as you wish, at such times as you wish, under such conditions that you wish. Uh, you can obtain uh, a high degree of control either with a trust or a company, foundation company, or a little bit no control at all. So it, it really gives you two very good options. You can, you can have, uh, you can hand off to professionals who can run it. Uh, I, you know, I highly recommend that where a trust is involved because running a trust for an average person is, is you know, is a challenge. Uh, there are people who trusts professionally and do that all day, every day, and those are the right sort of to do it. Um, and then you have that in place. So um, you have a plan that people will continue to run those structures. And again, we, we mentioned property being introduced into a, a, a Cayman Islands Trust or a foundation company. And again, the one thing you can do is, uh, and the one great thing about lifetime planning is if anything does happen to you, if you lose capacity or if you die, those lifetime plans carry on and your session can carry on even if you become incapacitated. So that's a real benefit of doing some lifetime planning. Um, so we mentioned shares of a private company can be held on a trust or, uh, a trust or foundation company. Um, management can remain under control of the individual despite divesting their equity stakes. So this is a, 
a, a real key thing in a sense. Um, so effectively, you divorce yourself from the ownership of the team. You manage control of the business is very uh, attractive to most entrepreneurial people. Um, you know, you came in on as professional trustees and professional fiduciaries uh, who can uh, step in and run those structures. And for business people as well, is um, often very beneficial when they're speaking with banks because um, obviously if you have a business that's owned outright by one individual, well, a question a bank may ask was, well, what happens if you buy a bus? What happens if you're in a home? What happens if you're in a business? Um, if you have it in a structure that can those things, um, you're a lot more attractive uh, with respect to borrowing, etc. And it's probably even more so in these times when banks will, will certainly tighten up on their on their uh, at, at least until uh, things settle down in the markets, etc. Um, so again, individual can design their plan uh, or their business and affairs to carry on for several generations. So that's the other thing you can project out generations as you wish, so that if you've acquired um, you know uh, considerable wealth during your, your life, that can be spread out. Uh, several generations, which is right. And again, we have this concept of you can have your cake and eat it as a business owner, meaning you can change control uh, without having the ownership while still enjoying the fruits of your labor and the profits. Another uh, real benefit of that. Um, so I'm just going to launch to a bit of uh, just something specific on planning and how uh, what you should be doing. Uh, in light of current events. So well, five points there, we'll just run through those quickly. So what's the plan? So we talked about wills being a key part of any estate plan. Um, and failure to have a valid will means the law will decide who gets your property in what shares after you die. And again, we refer to this as an intestacy. And again, intestacy can in certain circumstances work well, uh, but of course, you then lose control and you're at the mercy of the intestacy formula. And again, shortfalls with respect to guardianship of minor children, um, digital assets, all these sorts of things, managing online presence, uh, all of those things are not um, counted in the intestacy. So the idea is that um, possibly you don't want to see yourself in intestacy because um, the, the results are just too unpredictable. Um, now, obviously, we've talked about wills, um, although wills are a key part of any estate plan. Uh, there's other things that can be done without structuring. So, for example, uh, you know, placing assets in joint name. I would say, for instance, a, a joint bank account or a, a, a joint ownership in a property. Um, it's entirely possible if you place those into joint names, they will automatically, meaning uh, as soon as you die, they reference to the will, but there's no reference to a procedure. So what some people do as part of their plans is um, they will make assets joint with their spouse, um, so that actually there's really no need for a will. Um, so that's a very simple technique that can be used, um, but of course doesn't account for the other things I've mentioned. Um, there's also potential to use insurance, trusts, companies, other, other tools. Um, and there's, you know, the more complex an estate is, uh, the, the more of those elements may be built into it. So really, that there's no one size fits all plan here. Um, you know, really it depends on your own personal circumstances and what you're hoping to achieve. And some people uh, are more complicated than others. Um, point is, whatever your plan is, um, it's important to review it, especially at these moments in time like this. Um, you know, you have to be aware of is, you know, if you become ill, whether it's caused by COVID or, or whatever, and impair your mental faculties. And so if that can prevent you from taking steps, putting a plan in action. Um, so it's really not a good idea to delay. You, you've got to do these things while you have your full faculties. Um, if you don't have faculties, that um, it, you know, it, it can open the door for litigation, it can open the door for people challenging your will. Uh, or whatever you've been playing. Um, that's uh, something to bear in mind. Um, the other thing is, uh, and we've touched on this briefly, is well, where are your assets located? Um, so, 
you know, a lot of people in the Cayman Islands will have assets in different places. Again, uh, a large portion of our population comes from abroad. Um, you know, they may have homes, they may have investments in other, other places. Um, and each of those places will have different regimes and different regulations. Um, so me as a practitioner, I, you know, I always try and flush out what your assets and, and you know, how those assets are really held. Um, yeah, and some is possible to deal with that, the global will, but again, there are, I, I do that for the reasons of it, which is, um, you just don't know how the regimes in other countries are going to deal with uh, a Cayman Islands will trying to assert uh, jurisdiction over a foreign country. So that's, that's the primary reason why I do it. Um, the other thing is, if you have assets outside of the Cayman Islands, it's always best to speak to an estate practitioner there um, to, to ensure that what you're trying to achieve is achievable, uh, ensuring that there, if there are any scope to uh, decrease uh, tax, that, that those are taken up. So if you're unsure um, and you're not sure where to start, the recommendation is go to the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners website, and it lists out all persons who have that designation. Um, the Society of Trust and Estate Practitioners is a, is a global organization. They have people in, in, in every country practically, um, and those persons will be vetted and have to go through some fairly rigorous uh, training before they can call themselves a, a, a trust and estate practitioner. So they usually that's the gold standard of anyone in the city. Um, otherwise, most Cayman Islands attorneys here will have contacts and connections with uh, persons, uh, state practitioners in other, in other countries. And uh, the idea is that you work hand in glove um, with the foreign estate practitioners to make sure uh, the estate plan uh, dovetails. So, um, how much is your estate now worth? So, again, we've seen in the last couple of months really um, some shocks to the system with respect to assets, especially um, equities, uh, quoted investments, um, likely to spill over into the housing market. Um, and as a result of that, um, Anyone who has an estate plan in place now or is looking to put an estate plan in really has to do a sober review of what those assets are and what they're actually worth now. Um, and the thing is, the reason for that is twofold. One is, if you're trying to achieve a sense of balance for beneficiaries, obviously you don't want to, you want to do those adjustments in light of current events. And the other thing is, um, a will is not something, again, we've talked about that before, that you draft and you just throw in a drawer and forget about. You, you've got to dust it off and see whether or not it's still valid and still, it still reflects um, what your current wishes are. Um, so in, in COVID-19, where assets have gone down, it's, it's well worth doing that balancing exercise again, because um, your beneficiaries who may be aggrieved, who may, may have got less than their you know, somebody else who and they feel they've been hard done by may have uh, a go at challenging the estate, whether that's justified or not. Um, the last thing you want is estate litigation because estate litigation, really the only, uh, the only winners are people like us, the, the lawyers who, who charge large sums of money to sort these things out. Um, and uh, so I always steer my clients in a way to try to reduce that risk as much as possible. And so those who don't have a succession plan really need to take that into account. They need to, again, do a very sober review of their assets to make sure that um, there is a balance to be achieved if, if that's what they're going for, if you're going for balance. Um, who are you? It sounds like an odd question, but um, what you have to do as a practitioner is you really have to drill into who your client is and what sort of connections they may have with other countries. Um, and also we have to, you know, I have to drill down and figure out what is the domicile status of a client. Simply because if you've retained a friend domicile, meaning you've retained strong connections to another country, um, laws of the country may end up affecting your, um, your, your, your global estate and how it's taxed and how it devolves. So, um, you know, you look at things like um, in the Cayman Islands where we have, again, a large 
portion of our population are patriots. Um, many of you here on the war from it. Um, and the idea of domicile is that you can domicile generally it's assigned to you at birth. Uh, it's usually uh, the country where you were born and where you have the strongest connections. Um, and it is possible to shed that domicile by doing a couple of key steps. The main one is actually leaving that jurisdiction. Uh, having an intention to run, reside somewhere uh, run, and then you know going there and residing. Um, in Cayman it's unique because the question is, is does an expat on a work permit who comes here may have every intention in the world of staying in the Cayman Islands for, for the rest of their lives because they love it here because why not? Came from one place. Um, but the fact is they're dependent on a work permit. So does that mean they've actually shed their domicile? They haven't shed their domicile. That means their their estate, even though you know, all of their assets are in Cayman, um, could be affected by the domicile of their place of origin. So that's it you have to think about. Um, another unique thing uh, about Cayman Islands: a, a lot of Caymanians, especially in the older generation, uh, were born in the United States, and that's historic because effectively back. Uh, you know, uh, facilities were not as as good as they are now. Um, many people would go up to the United States simply because the the, the health facility and healthcare was better there. But of course, once you were born in the States, um, you are a U.S. citizen for life, um, and you are taxed on your world income by the state. Um, and a lot of humanity may have never held the U.S. passport. They may have uh, maybe not even be aware that they were born in the United States or, or may be aware of it, but don't understand the implications of it. Um, so these are the sort of things that you need to, to bear in mind, is what are your connections to other countries? Um, and is that going to a state? So that's another thing that I sort of drill into when, uh, when I'm advising clients. Okay, last but not least, um, Charitable giving. This is a, a real sort of trend that has been emerging. Um, that more and more persons, especially high net worth, persons, are are pouring a lot more money into charitable giving. Um, and in light of what's going on with COVID and the uh, impacts on as well, and and uh, more and more people are going to be thankful, and more and more are sort of be dependent on on, on charities. Uh, to make ends meet. We're seeing a direct effect of that and very starkly with things like meals on people struggling to have uh, meet here, They've lost their jobs very suddenly without any opportunity to plan uh, or put aside money. And, you know, many people, um, you know, in the Cayman Islands, you know, it's a very expensive place to live, as everybody knows. Uh, many people live in Penn, um, and it's very difficult for them to, to set money aside. And so, you know, I'm encouraging clients uh, in light of that to, to think about um, you know, giving charitable gifts, looking at good charities that, um, that do good work in the Cayman Islands, uh, and to have a think about um, you know making some provision in their wills for that. And again, we've seen this a trend in high, high net worth individuals, people like Bill Gates and uh, and Warren Buffett, and so on. Um, they're committing to uh, large, you know, the majority of their charitable uh, causes. And the reason for that is there is an effect, and you see this when you do private work and you work with high net worth individuals, is that um, oftentimes the people who create the wealth, uh, their offspring um, sometimes get a sort of and they're expecting um, you know, to inherit large sums of money, so they, they become demotivated, uh, they come dependent on that wealth, they become, uh, you know, disinterested in, 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 in trying to carve their own way. And so uh, what high net worth people are doing is looking at, well, you know, I don't want my children to become completely dependent on the wealth I've created, because what sort of a life is that? How, how a full life uh, if they've just been handed, um, you know, the means to get through their life without lifting a finger. Um, so you're seeing that as a trend. Um, and I'm encouraging clients now, even clients with states doing a bit of charitable gifting because it's just uh, it's it's just not a bad thing to do, especially clients. So 
that is my uh, presentation. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Robert. <clears throat> there was a little bit of feedback and we apologize for that. I'm not sure where it was coming from. It may, it may have been, uh, but nevertheless, uh, hopefully it didn't distort too much from the presentation. And there was uh, something on your screen that flashed quite a bit saying remove something from the icon. Robert, I'm not sure, but it was showing on some, some of our devices. But obviously when we post that to, uh, to our website with the recording, we'll obviously have the clean bank of slides. You see it there coming up? Please remove yeah, this. Yeah, I, I didn't see that until just this minute. I don't, I don't yeah. know what that is. I'm know not how sure to... what that is. In any case, if anybody has any questions, you can submit them by the chat or raise your hands, and I'd be more than happy to open your mic so you can participate and asking any questions. So Barbara has one here. It said, in, in Cayman, what is the order of uh, testacy if someone does, does, does um, not have a will? For example, someone married with children with no will. Yeah, so the, the typical, um, th that's a very typical scenario in a testacy. Effectively, if the estate is under 20, valued under 20,000 Cayman Islands dollars, then the surviving spouse can hold it. Um, if it's over, uh, over 20,000 dollars, then uh, the spouse gets 50%. They get all of the chattels, meaning um, anything movable, um, uh, anything in the house, et cetera, um, and 50% of the estate, and the other is split between uh, the surviving children. Um, there's more complicated formulas depending on scenarios, um, but effectively what, what the intestacy rules try to do is try to distribute your estate as evenly between those persons closest to you by, by relation to marriage or by, um, uh, by blood. So if there's no children, but there are brothers and sisters, they'll, they'll get it. There's, no brothers and sisters, but there's half brothers and sisters, they will get it. If there's aunts and uncles, there's none of them go down to aunts and uncles and et cetera, et cetera. So it, it sort of, it, it goes out further and further in the social circle. Um, but for the average person who's, who dies in test state, who has a spouse and has children, it's, it's generally, and it's above 20,000 CI, then it's, it's basically a 50-50 split between the, the surviving spouse and the children. Um. I don't think there's there's anybody I have any questions. Um, again, there's another message here. Let's see what it is. As a small business owner with two shareholders, both Caymanian, what is the best way for the owners to deal with their shares in relation to their wills? Yeah, well, you've, where you've got a business that's owned two separate individuals, well, each individual will have their own plan and will have their own idea about what should happen to their share of the business. So it's really kind of to them to decide what they want to do. Um, I, I suppose that the key is where you've got an operating business that's going to carry on and is, you know, they will carry on beyond their, their death. They really have to sit down as partners and work out, well, how, how do we want to do this? Do you, you know, if I were to die, would you like to buy my share out or something or have a first refusal or something? Um, because the, the, that sort of arrangement is um, where you've got an operating business and uh, one has their will and they, they have 10 kids and they, so they give their, each kid gets a, a portion of the business. Um, you know, the management of that business can become unwieldy because then all of a sudden you go from a situation where you've got two shareholders who may agree on most things to, to 11 shareholders, you all know, disagree. So really, it's, it's kind of up to those business owners to sit down and discuss what would happen in the worst case scenario and how they would want that to work yeah. out. And, you know, it, it depends on whether the, um, each business owner wants their family to carry on in the business. And if that's the case, then really it's just a question of, of, of discussing it with their partners and, and, and saying, well, look, I want my family to carry on, at least with an ownership interest. And here I to do it, um, I would say it'd be worthwhile doing some lifetime planning so that the business of the operation of the business is not disrupted um, by, again, by a fraction of ownership because the ownership goes from two to 10. 
Okay, are there any other questions? You can put them in the chat or raise your hand and I'll open your mic. Well, if there are no other questions, I don't see anything else. You must have answered a lot of, uh, a lot of things here. Robert, appreciate it. I don't see any hands raised or anything. So um, here's, hold on, two, two, two messages. Okay, here's one. What is the order of testacy if someone does not have a will? For example, someone married with children with outside, with outside, who are outside the marriage. Right. The, the, the Cayman Islands Cayman distinguish between legitimate and illegitimate children, so they would just take a legitimate would take the share that any legitimate child would take. So if you've got a, a spouse, um, they would again, assuming the estate is over twenty thousand, uh, they would take half of the estate plus all the channels, and then the remaining would be split between legitimate and illegitimate. And then there's another question. If a property is listed as A and B, does this, does this pass outside the will? Um, I think we're talking about joint ownership. So if you have a property that is jointly owned by two separate people, there are two, there are two different ways to hold property. Uh, one jointly, uh, one is, gives you the ability to pass it by your will and the other, it passes simply on your death. So it depends on how that property is, is set up. But the vast majority of jointly owned property, it passes on death. So that share would, would, would just pass um, to the surviving co-owner. Okay, I mean, um, again, any other questions, you can post them to the chat or this is your last chance. We're just coming up on an hour then on the presentation a little under. Well, again, I'm, I'm happy to, if, if people have questions after, um, I mean, my email address is there and phone number, et cetera. So I'm happy if, if there's some more personal questions that rather than different group, I think, um, you know, I'm quite happy to, to answer those offline. All right, fantastic. Well, I just want to say thank you, Robert, for, um, sharing this presentation with us and uh, we really appreciate it and as robert said you know he's happy to take further questions through the numbers or his email and also just like to remind everybody that this uh, this uh, presentation will is being has been recorded and will be posted to the chamber website chambercovidupdates.ky along with the slide presentation that is shared so i'd like to thank everybody for participating and i hope you have a great day Thank you very much, everyone.